Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Building the Black Educator Pipeline podcast. I am your host, Shada Terrell, educator, activist, dedicated to the lifelong struggle of freedom and liberation for her her people. I'm so excited to see you all back here again. Shout out to my co-conspirators out there who come back and support us week after week. And welcome to our new guests and our new supporters here to join us this afternoon. Um, I want to thank everybody who always supports the Center for Black Educator Development and supports our movement of We Need Black Teachers. Please make sure you are visiting www.weneedblackteachers.org to find out more information about our We Need Black Teachers campaign. Um, and shout out to all our young people who joined us last month for our virtual Mbangi, um, facilitated and led by Dr. Greg Carr. Uh, we will be having another one coming up on the 20th. The link will be out soon. Make sure you invite all Black high school students out. I am super excited about today's show, y'all. Um, this is a timely show. Um, with all that's going on in our country today, I think uh, leadership and building on what's happened in the past to learn in the present is super important. Um, so today's theme, we'll be st- talking about building a Black educator pipeline through perseverance and sustainability. And today we'll be taking a look at the road to freedom and liberation and how the fight still continues. My three guests today are civil rights activists, two proud members of SNCC um, and founders and participants in the Freedom Schools movement. We also have a super proud African-American scholar and historian here that will be joining us today. So this is a show that you do not want to miss and you don't want others to miss. So please like, share and comment um, and interact with our guests. So I am going to start with you. I know I love to read people's bios because just of the world of information we learn and the contributions that folks are making out in our community today. Um, But for the sake of time, we have three guests today. I'm going to read a shortened version of each of um, my guest bios and their accomplishments. Right? (laughs) It's super long. I can't like we be at forever reading. Um, But I'm going to read a shortened version for each of my guests. So I'm going to start with Dr. Charles Payne. He's the director of the Conwell Center and the Henry Rutgers Distinguished Professor of African American Studies, his interests include urban education and school reform, school inequality, social change, and modern African American history. He has authored and co-edited several books. Dr. Charles has won awards from Southern Regional Council, Choice Magazine, the Simmons Weistel Center, and the you know these names, Gustavas Myers Center for the Study of Human Rights in North America. He has been named the Ed Scholars List of Scholars, contributing to most substantially to the public debates about education every year from 2015 to 2020. He has won several teaching awards at Northwestern University and Duke University. Dr. Payne intends to publish two more books in 2020. Um, he indoubtedly is proud of the fact that he earned one of the country's first bachelor's degrees in African-American studies from Syracuse Universities. His doctorate is in sociology from Northwestern University. My second guest, um, known to many as uh, Charlie, <laughs> but Charlie E. Cobb Jr. was born in Washington, D.C. in 1943. After entering Howard University in 1961, he became active with the campus nonviolent action group, NAG, an affiliate of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Cobb left Howard one year later to work full-time as SNCC's field secretary in Mississippi Delta. While working in that state, he originated the proposal for freedom schools that became such an important part of the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project. Uh, we at our orgs like to call him sometimes the father of the freedom schools movement. Uh, we appreciate his work and are carrying that on. But after leaving Mississippi in 1967, he founded Drum and Spear Bookstore in Washington, D.C. and was a co-founder of the Center for Black Education in the same city and lived for two years in the East African nation of Tanzania. A founding member of the National Association of Black Journalists in 1975, Cobb began his journalism career in 1974 as a reporter um, in Washington, D.C. In 1967, he joined a staff of National Public Radio as foreign affairs reporter. And from 1985 to 1997, Cobb was a member of the editorial staff for National Geographic magazine, the first black writer to become one of the magazine's staff writers. Cobb is an author. His latest book, the not, this nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Has guns made the civil rights movement possible? 
He is a board member of the Stick Legacy Project. Uh, between nineteen, I mean, between twenty fifteen and twenty seventeen, Cod led, led the SLP collaboration with Duke University to create digital gateway to SNCC and his work. The 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 site was launched in March two thousand seventeen. And then in June of 2018, Cobb was the recipient of the Carnegie Fellow in the category of Democracy to help facilitate his current project, a book published by Duke University, pressed on today's young movement for Black Lives that tentatively titled Get in the Way, Protest, Politics, Movement for Black Lives. And my last guest, last but most certainly not least, Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons with Dr. <laughs> Is retired is a retired professor in African American studies and religious studies and affiliated faculty in women's from the University of Florida. She attained she um, obtained her BA from Ednock University um, in Human Services and her MA in Religious Studies and her PhD in Islamic Studies from Temple University. Right, right here, y'all. Shout out <laughs> Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Simmons began. Her active civil rights movement during her freshman year at Smelvin College in Atlanta, Georgia in 1962. She became SNCC's field secretary two years later in 1964 when she joined hundreds of other college students and volunteers who traveled to Mississippi to work the Mississippi, Mississippi Freedom Project and was assigned, assigned to Mount Laurel, Mississippi, where she became one of three project directors in the state, three women project directors in the state. After leaving Mississippi, um, Dr. Simmons went to my hometown, woo -woo, New York, um, and worked for SNCC, organizing high school and college students and friends of the SNCC group. Simmons is a prolific speaker on colleges, universities, campuses, as well as community forums. She's featured in several films on the civil rights movement and on women in Islam. Additionally, she's written in numerous articles and essays on civil rights movements and women um, in Islam. So please, Everybody, <laughs> after all that information and all of them that's doing all of this great work for years upon years, please welcome to the show, Baba Charlie Cobb, Mama's Raya, and Charles Payne, Dr. Payne. Welcome, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful <laughs> introduction. Yes. Indeed, indeed. I always crack up when I read people's bios. They're like, whoo, some of them be like, I did all that? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> And the people need to know about it, and we have to pay homage. We thank you for joining us today. Um, I just think that this show today and having you guys on is super timely. And I think that, as always, we are trying to learn how to continue to fight and carry the movement and kind of pick up the mantle and carry the legacy that you guys have, have really built. Um, so one of the things I think is important to explore for people to hear is how did you guys even wind up in the movement? Right, because when I read your bios, um, you guys are back in college um, doing this work, and Dr. Payne, you've been back since you were a young guy researching this work. So I think it's really important to, for people to find out, like, if I'm a freshman at whatever college, like, how can I do what they did? So I want to start with you, uh, Barbara Charlie. Um, can you uh, say something about how that Freedom Schools idea developed, um, and any particular influences like that had on you that that sparked that idea? Yeah, well, education has always been linked to black struggle. In that sense, uh, freedom schools don't actually begin with me because I'm thinking, if I'm thinking of beginnings, I'm thinking of Septima Clark, Hello? Uh, for yes. instance, uh, who was, you know, well, long before I was deeply involved. Uh, and I'm thinking of Ella Baker. I'm thinking yes. about, because um, I live, uh, uh, in Florida, you know, I'm thinking of, oh, wow, Zara, you can help me out. Uh, uh, they were blown up on Christmas in 1951. Oh, God, uh, yes. The yes. Moors, Harry Moore. Yeah, Harry T. Moore. and Harriet and Moore. Moore. Harriet Moore. Yeah, Harriet Moore and Harry T. Moore. And Harry T. Moore was the head of the state NACP. Mrs. Moore was a teacher. And the school year for her began when, when, by her collecting the books that the state had issued uh, for the students to read uh, and uh, starting them on her own curriculum with her own set of books that they took turns reading. So there's a whole history that links education to the struggle for freedom. And in Mississippi, it was perfectly obvious 
uh, even, although I was surprised, let me say, when I first went to Mississippi because they saw all these brand new school buildings, at least up in the Delta where I was working. And, you know, I had come to Mississippi thinking, well, they'd be going to school in shacks. But when you went into those schools, they were, you would see they're nothing but shells, hmm. empty. The libraries were empty. The labs didn't have test tubes and microphones. So they were, you know, just shells built to uh, reinforce the argument of separate but equal, when in fact the schools were designed, as we used to call them, uh, for sharecropper education. Mm -hmm. And the 1964, we were aware of it, but not able to do much about it uh, until the 1964 summer project resulted in almost a thousand uh, young students coming from all over the country. And, and the idea was born, therefore, out of the idea, uh, uh, what do we do with these people? They don't really know the state. Uh, they're mostly white. Uh, uh, so the I, what we decided and what was in my mind was, well, we can use them to teach, to fill at least some of the gaps that schools uh, leave. Uh, you know, we knew we couldn't in a six month summer program, six week summer program, uh, fulfill, uh, deal with the whole gap mm -hmm. in student education. But it was a way to use their uh, knowledge and even though most weren't trained as teachers. My point is that what you really have to understand about freedom schools is that they were linked to black struggle. And there's a whole history of the linkage of education, meaning education of black students to black struggle. There was a reason schools were outlawed, outlawed during the, for black people were outlawed during the days of slavery. And what you see is secret schools. Hmm. Uh, there's a oak tree on the campus of Hampton University. It's called Emancipation Oak because uh, uh, underneath that oak tree, uh, Mary, Mary, Mary Peak, I want to say, uh, maintained a secret school because education and schools were outlawed, or as Frederick Douglass put it clearly, I think, education unfits a child to be a slave. Mm. Uh, and those are the roots of, of freedom schools. And I come from a family in which several members were teachers. So I grew up with the idea. I went to a Rosenwald school. People, I don't oh. think they have anymore. I have in my day. I went to a Rosenwald school in school. Kentucky. Uh, and every day started with us standing up, singing lift every voice and sing. And we had to stand up. And I still, when I hear the song, can just stand up. <laughs> so uh, education, black liberation are linked is what I want to stress in our conversation. And that inspired you to kind yeah, of- Yeah, like I, I simply wrote a proposal to SNCC. To, I to said, SNCC. since we got all these students coming down here, Let's why see. don't we? <laughs> And I think it's available on various sites now. But it it, 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 you know, I simply wrote a proposal because we were struggling with this question. Of, well, what are we going to do with all these people coming? Yeah. We had huge arguments about bringing these students down to Mississippi, at least hey. the white ones. Uh, and, Baba, uh, I love that you say that. <laughs> but yeah, was, we I, did. Like, I like that because that, that puts the real into it, right? This wasn't some magical kind of thing that just came together, right? People are going to debate, people are going to fight, people are going to, you're talking about black liberation on the table, yeah. right? So people are going to have different modes of opinions and thoughts and things of that nature. Um, but yeah. you wrote the proposal and, and some beauty really came out of that. It really wasn't much of a proposal. It was really more on the order of a memo. <laughs> just say, hey, folks, why don't we think about doing this? That's, I mean, it's not, it's not a proposal the way proposals are recognized are now. <laughs> today. It was just an idea. Hey, here's my idea about what we should do with these people. That's amazing. And uh, Mama Zarari, you were one of the people that heard the call, right? Definitely. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your work as director of Freedom Schools in Laurel? Uh, 
how was that for you? Well, let me just go back to uh, say that uh, I had gotten involved in the civil rights movement, as you noted, in, in introducing me as a freshman at Spelman College in Atlanta. And when I got involved, of course, uh, SNCC uh, was maybe two or three blocks from the campus. And uh, so the SNCC uh, workers were often on the campus uh, recruiting us to go on demonstrations, etc. Uh, and so additionally, I had the great uh, privilege of having selected without having any idea who he was, Stoughton Lind, uh, for my freshman year as a uh, history professor in my first history class I took. And um, we became friends beyond him being an incredible mentor to me. And of course, the more involved I got in the civil rights movement, uh, the more I got involved with SNCC. Uh, I learned about the plan for Mississippi Freedom Summer. <clears throat> and in my sophomore year, uh, as I learned more about it, I was clear that I had to go. Uh, now, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, so I am I grew up in the Jim Crow era. And I knew all the horror stories about Mississippi. Uh, and, of course, had lived a few horror stories there in Memphis. Uh, so I was clear that it was dangerous to go. But nonetheless, uh, the fact that people could not vote uh, Black people could not vote in Mississippi was such an outrage to me that I felt mm -hmm. even though dangerous, I had to join with the students who were going. Now, Stoughton Lynn uh, was one of the people working on developing the curriculum for the freedom schools. And as I was taking another class with him in my sophomore year, I got involved with helping him with that. And so I was clear, not only was I going to go to Mississippi, but I was going to be a Freedom School teacher. Uh, had no idea of being a director, but a teacher. And so I was uh, assigned to Laurel, Mississippi uh, to be the Freedom School director. Uh, later, we can talk about how I came to become the director of the whole project. But uh, the Freedom School was an integral part, as Charlie has said, of our uh, 64 Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. And while it started out uh, somewhat lightly, as Charlie has indicated, it became one of the primary uh, features and an important part of Mississippi summer. And the uh, organizing of the Freedom Schools meant that we got more parents involved as well as young people involved in the movement. Uh, and so this is, it was uh, amazing to see how we went from zero to, you know, 80 miles an hour in terms of getting a school up and running uh, getting a site for it, which was very difficult. I mean, people were afraid. Uh, Jones County was headquarters for the Ku Klux Klan, and the head of the Klan lived in Laurel. Uh, everyone knew this was a dangerous undertaking. But nonetheless, the community helped us uh, uh, take an old boarded up nightclub and turn that into our Freedom School Center as well as our offices. Uh, people brought food for the children's lunches. I mean, this was a community effort. And it's important to know that many adults, when they saw what was happening, they said, we want to, we want to come to school too. Can't y'all do something at night so we can come after we get off from work? 
And so, yes, we did do that. We extended the program into the evening, uh, some of it being literacy training. But in terms of the young people, we had them from six to 18. Um, and I always worked with the older young people, uh, teaching them political science, civics, et cetera. It was exciting. And uh, I had never taught before, except in Sunday school, in my church. <laughs> But uh, we had a wonderful curriculum and we were adhering to it as well as expanding upon it. And the children were so excited. The parents were excited. So it was such a wonderful introduction for me to grassroots organizing and how hmm. you go about getting people involved uh, in the work that was going to change their lives forever. Amazing. Amazing. And Dr. Payne, I'll shoot another question over to you being like, you know, the historian um, of all of this. What impact do you think like starting this movement and this involvement um, had on a development of Black liberation for the Black community at that time? I'll come back to that. <laughs> I, I just want to comment on a couple of things. Of course. Part of what's interesting about Harry T. Moore, the Moors were killed Christmas Eve, 1951. Their daughter would have been killed, except she was on her way home from her job on Washington. And she was still on the train when the family when, when the family home was just, was just blown up. But it, it, it's pretty certain that the reason the Moors were killed is that he was leading a campaign, campaign of protest against the county sheriff who had killed two young black men who were in custody. In handcuffs, if my memory is right. And I just want to say, 1951, and in terms of the way in which the police violence, state violence story has evolved, it's just to remind folk of how rooted we are, how far back those 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 things go. And and mm -hmm. and Charlie is just utterly silly for him to say it's just a proposal. It is a beautiful piece of writing. Thank it is you. a beautiful, thoughtful, deep. <laughs> That, it, it, it's an enduring piece. I'm ashamed that I did not bring a piece, so I didn't bring a copy so I could read it. But it is all over the web. Uh, I encourage everyone to look at, look at it and to think about its contemporary uh, its contemporary resonance. Um, and in terms of the impact on Black liberation, I, I think uh, I mean the impact on liberation struggles over time from these schools, right? Uh, I visited actually a SNCC person in, 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 in Budapest a few years ago, and he said, well, you know, there are freedom schools here in Hungary, right? Uh, the Roma people have adapted the idea, who in some ways may have been more, may be more pressed now than Blacks in Mississippi were in 1964. That's entirely possible, right? They're getting a rough deal over there, right? Mm. They are using freedom schools as, 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 as a way to think about how they build the next generation of activist leaders for their struggle, right? Uh, it's been used in Northern Ireland. It's been used in South Africa. It's been, it's been used in England. It is part of the inspiration for the Black Panther Liberation Schools, um, the Boston Freedom Schools. American labor unions have have, have, have have used the model. So that notion of combining education and struggle, the notion of, of, of combining education with, with what I think is a particularly keen kind of respect for the people you're educating, right? And, 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 and seeing the school literally as a part of the community, deep connections between, right? You read the descriptions of freedom schools, one thing that always strikes me, kids and adults just came by, the, it, they, be, it, they became their hangout places in their towns, right? You would go by there for no, pur no particular purpose, just to be there. And that speaks mm -hmm. volume about who owned those schools, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and where do we find educational space today that our community owns the way they own those schools? I think that's a key. So anyway, uh, a, a, l l long story short, uh, their impact has been huge and enduring. And if, if, if you will let me ask just one question. From, from, of course. I, I would love to hear each of them say something about how they originally came into the movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll start. Uh, you know, as uh, my friend uh, who is now passed, Bob Moses, used to say, the sit-ins woke me up. Uh, you know, 1960, those students sat in uh, first in uh, Greensboro, and then those sit-ins spread like wildfire. 
over the spring. Uh, within two months, there were sit-ins unfolding in uh, oh, some 80 southern cities. And what I'm seeing with the sit-ins uh, is uh, people my own age uh, engaged in struggle. Up until the sit-ins, at least from my point of view, uh, civil rights was something grown-ups did. Maybe they bought you an NAACP card to be a part of the youth uh, chapter. But by and large, when you thought about sit-ins as a, say, a 14-year-old as I was when Emmett Till was murdered, mm. you thought of it as something grown-ups did. And what the sit-ins, I'm looking at people my own age uh, uh, engaged in civil rights struggle and at Hammer Homes home the idea that this is something I can do. To make a long story short, as a result of being involved in the sit-ins as a Howard University student, I wound up on a bus tr intending to travel to Houston, Texas, but I got off the bus in Mississippi, Jackson, because the students were sitting in there. And I thought it was one thing for me to be sitting in as a Howard student in Virginia or Maryland. It's something qualitatively different to be sitting in in Mississippi where Emmett Till was killed, because that's what defined Mississippi to me. So I wanted to meet them. Uh, and there's a lesson in this. Uh, so I did. I made my way to their headquarters, explained to them, as, as I'm explaining to you, that I'm on the way to Texas for this workshop for young activists. CORE was sponsoring. And one of these students, Lawrence Giot, who has passed, but who was then just graduating from Tougaloo College and would become not simply a SNCC field secretary, but ultimately the chairman of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. He got up from his seat when I said, I'm on the way to this conference. And Giot was a big guy, six feet, he's bulky, and kind of hovered over me with complete disdain. And he said, and, and, I can, and I can quote him exactly, he said, you're going to Texas for a workshop on civil rights? What's the point of doing that when you're standing right here in Mississippi? And I got the message, you know, you can go off somewhere and chatter if you want to, but that's not serious. What's serious is what we're doing. You ought to stay with us, which is what I did because it was summer. And I wound up working. Uh, in uh, Mississippi. I never did get to that conference. Uh, uh, <laughs> and then what I realized was uh, once you start to do that and you're working with people and you really are bringing danger with you when you work in these communities, mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't just at the end of the summer say, well, folks, it's been interesting, but I've got to go register for classes. Uh, at least I'm not made up that way. Uh, so I stayed and I stayed. I wound up staying for over four years uh, in Mississippi, you know, as a SNCC uh, field secretary. So the point is, though, that what really drives movement, and I'll end on this, uh, and, and it's what my story shows, as much as their struggle against white supremacy, racism, and all of that, Jim Crow, what's really important to understanding Black struggle is the struggle black people make to one another within the black community. That's what really drives struggle and really drives shame. If you travel with Mrs. Hamer, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, for instance, she's challenging people all along the way. She's saying, basically, if I can do this with my third grade education, you all got no excuse mm. for not being involved. She's challenging in much the same way that Giat challenged me, because I certainly probably would not have stayed in Mississippi if Giat hadn't backed me up against the wall and hovered over me uh, talking about, <laughs> you know, why are you going somewhere to chatter? We're doing <laughs> stuff here. You ought to help us do stuff. And, and, that, and that was the doorway, in some ways more than the cities. That was the doorway uh, that got me deeply involved uh, uh, with movement struggle in the deep south, in my case, uh, Mississippi. And if you talk to students, SNCC people, they all have some kind of story like that. 
uh, <laughs> something that's pulling them in. And it's usually that something comes from the black community. It's mm -hmm. not simply protest against white people and what they do. Mm -hmm. Baba Charlie, thank you for sharing that. Um, Mama, we would love to hear how you got involved in the movement. Well, as, <clears throat> uh, yes, it's great. And I've heard Charlie tell that story. It's so wonderful. Uh, yeah. I, well, first of all, I grew up in, in Memphis in Jim Crow South and, you know, went to all black schools and lived in an all black neighborhood, all black church. And so while, you know, segregation and um, just the overt oppression of black people was something that I grew up in. Uh, but at the same time, in the home, in the church, and in the school, I was being taught that these were lies. I was not mm -hmm. inferior. I was somebody. Uh, and I believed it. So that was the bedrock. And I knew that Jim Crow segregation was wrong. At the same time, you know, uh, my grandmother was doing everything she could to keep me from getting involved. And when she and my mother and stepdad dropped me off uh, in Atlanta and, you know, the sit in movement was raging, uh, you know, it was two years in. And so people were marching constantly uh, in many cities, including Atlanta. And my grandmother was very aware of that. And she made me swear that I wasn't going to get involved. <laughs> and I did mean it when I said it to her because I was the first person in my family to go to college. And everybody was so excited, my church folk, my school, my family. And so I meant it when I said, I'm not going to get involved. I'm, she said, I'm, I'm bringing you here to get an education so you can make something out of yourself. I'm like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I know. I know. So I really meant it. But, you know, fate meant something else because without even knowing who he was, because the other thing was I better join a church as soon as I find out where the nearest one was. So I went to uh, the um, West Hunter Street Baptist Church, which was two or three blocks from the uh, Atlanta University campuses. And it was uh, pastored by Ralph David Abernathy. I had no idea who he was. Lo and behold, he was Dr. King's right-hand lieutenant, right? And as I mentioned, I take a class with someone whom I never knew anything about, Storton Lynn, who's teaching Black history. I mean, not that that's what it was called. So. I'm learning about slave revolts. I'm learning about the struggle black people have been engaged in from 1619, much of which I knew nothing about. And then the SNCC people are constantly on campus and basically calling us Uncle Toms for not joining the march. Well, these three places, I mean, they wore me down. I felt ashamed that I wasn't involved. Yes. I mean, cause I knew they were right. So, of course, I, you know, and Spelman didn't want us involved. So that was the other problem. And I was there on full scholarship. And at free, uh, freshman orientation, they told us that if we got involved, we could lose our scholarships. So I'm really caught here in a conundrum. At the same time, I had to do it, you know, and I kept trying to figure out ways to not get caught. So, you know, I had my roommate lying to the house mom about where I was. And initially I said, I'm not going to get arrested because then they won't know, you know. And so on all these demonstrations, then I see my friends being dragged into paddy wagons and I'm ashamed all over again <laughs> that I'm sneaking off to run back to campus. You know, after a while, I was like, okay, I, I'm going to get arrested too. I'm not going to leave when they say disperse. So, of course, once I got arrested, that was it. Uh, you know, the school knew. They called my grandmother. I mean, so by the time Howard Moore got me out of jail, 
<laughs> and I got back to the campus, I was in big trouble. Plus, my <laughs> grandmother was threatening to come there and give me a whipping on top of everything else. <laughs> Anyway, that was how I got involved. And then, as I mentioned earlier, when I learned about Mississippi Summer Project, I said, I'm going. I know my grandmother and parents are not going to let me go. So I'm not going home after the end of the uh, sophomore uh, spring semester. I'm going to Mississippi. And I won't go into all the difficulties I had to get there. But anyway, um, it was like, you know, it was a call I had to answer. I mean, and both of your stories are like just so relevant and so timely, meaning it really depicts for me the sacrifice that both of you made um, to be in this movement. <laughs> Mama, your, your people is telling you no, your own college telling you no, like you are in risk <laughs> of losing education, um, yeah. your access to it, right? People, and you, your family is well-intentioned. Right. Very yes. well intentioned. Like, girl, well we are in school. You are going to college. You know what I mean? You're not going to be over here when this protest and stuff. Like, we got a plan. Like, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a lawyer. Very well intentioned. <laughs> um, and at the same time, you trying to listen. But every <laughs> what I loved about it is everywhere you went, somebody is like, so see, you got to get involved. <laughs> So as right. much as they try so let, to push you away from it, they push you towards it. <laughs> yes. If I can interrupt you here, of I mean, I, it's important for you to know uh, that I have never considered myself as having made a sacrifice mm. to be involved in the movement. Can you explain why? Yeah, uh, okay. yeah because I gained much more than I lost Absolutely. from not uh, continuing on uh, after my freshman year, uh, uh, many of the skill, I've been a writer, a reporter, really, for most of my working life. And, and many of the things I learned within the movement, how to speak to people, how to listen to people, how to work to understand the context of uh, people's life. Those were skills I learned in the movement. Mm. Uh, and so I, I, when I think back, to those few years of involvement. I was a little over four years direct involvement as a senior. I never think of it as having made a sacrifice I to, to I, like I say, I gain a lot more uh, in my life uh, from being involved than what s sacrificing, you know, not being able to continue on in history or romance languages or, right. or whatever. But that's what <laughs> you use romance language. But to me, I'm just about to say like, even how you just described that is so beautiful um, because from the outside looking in and for us folks looking back at history, it looked like a sacrifice, but mm -hmm. the way that you kind of position that as I gained so much from it, but we, the world, mm -hmm. us, the future, we gained so much from the work that you guys put in, which is why we probably saw it as a sacrifice. But for you to go into that liberation work and say, I gained more than I could have from going to that conference at Texas <laughs> or, you know what I mean, <laughs> staying, <laughs> staying on, <laughs> staying on uh, in school at that time, you gained so much more. But the reason why yeah. both of your words and your sacrifice speak so loud because we still have some of the right history pieces. So we still have some of those things today. Folks who would rather talk than do. Folks who would rather hold conversation than be about that action. Um, and you were, you all were about that action and are an example of that action. But you also are very descriptive of, when you look at activists, when you look at people in the struggle, it's not this prototype of a person who's like, yeah, I'm going out there and I'm dying for freedom. Eventually you get into that, right? And you sacrifice, but you guys would just, Two young people going to school <laughs> and literally just happened to stop somewhere along a bus route and said, like, I'm about to fall into the fight. So <laughs> it's amazing um, to hear both of your story stories. Um, I would love to hear, like, seeing that you didn't see it as a sacrifice um, and it was for your growth and development. Who in the movement do you feel like had the most impact on your development? Great question. Wow. I think I don't. I can't. You know, I could. Let me. Oh, if you want an individual, I would have to say Ella Baker. 
She mine too. But <laughs> uh, I would have to say Ella Baker, but the, in a larger sense than Miss Baker, and she was Miss Baker to us. Uh, it's the people. I what was unexpected, and what I regularly encountered in the South, in the Deep South, Mississippi, where I was working, was strength, deep wells of strength in communities mm. that a number of people held. If I ticked off names, none of them would be recognized by the canon, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But everywhere I went was involved, all the counties I worked in, there were always these people, sometimes World War II veterans, sometimes uh, uh, sharecroppers like uh, Mrs. Hamer was. Uh, but you encountered these deep wells of strength in black communities that you didn't know was there. I didn't know that in Washington, D.C., my hometown. I had one image of Mississippi, Emmett Till. And, and as far as I was concerned, black people were completely terrorized. You know, there were 35 chapters of Marcus Garvey's movement in Mississippi alone right. when that movement was active. I didn't expect any of that. And all the people I encountered along the way really defined this movement that I was a part of uh, in Mississippi. E.W. Steptoe, Janie Brewer, you know, uh, and so, I mean, I could just, you need a Blackwell. Uh, and Mrs. Hamer probably has the most fame, but there were a lot of people mm -hmm. in these communities had had the same kind of strength. And that's the one thing that everything I've managed to do, I've been uh, in my life, I've managed to do standing on the shoulders and in the blood of these people. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Bob. I just wanted to say that First of all, I want to absolutely say the same thing that Charlie has said um, about the sacrifice of, you know, I gained so much more than I gave. And I feel that while I was certainly shaped uh, prior to going away to school by my own grandmother, uh, by my teachers, uh, and the women who nurtured me in my church. I mean, so you're talking about standing on shoulders. Those are the first shoulders. But I want to just share that when I was uh, told that I was going to Laurel, Mississippi, mm -hmm. uh, let me just say one of the reasons that I thought I might survive and not get killed was because most of the students going were white. And so I mistakenly thought that those white Mississippians were not going to kill white students from other parts of the country. I said, they're not going to kill their own. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> the preservation of white supremacy. <laughs> before I could even get to Mississippi because uh, SNCC had put me on staff since I was basically thrown out of my home for going to, you know, wanting to be a volunteer and going against my folks. So they put me on staff so I could get that little $10 a week check that we got $9 and 35 cents after Uncle Sam took out our taxes. So because of that, I was in uh, the orientation session for two weeks, uh, not just the first week, when I was being trained to be a freedom school teacher, but the second week also to just uh, be a helper. And of course, it was in the second week that we learned that Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney had disappeared. And we were told by Bob Moses and Jim Foreman and the others, make no mistake, they are dead. Mm. So then I thought, oh my God, they killed two white men? So when I went to uh, Laurel, I knew that they would kill white people. So that had taken away all the things that I thought were going to protect me down there. Mm -hmm. Then on top of it, they said, 
we can't even send white people to Laurel. It's too dangerous. <laughs> so we're only sending you and two other black people because we need you all to be sort of incognito there. And I'm like, incognito? Are you kidding me? <laughs> anyway, so we get to Laurel. There isn't a structure that we know about. We do have the NAACP list of members. So I go to this lady's house. I knock on her door. She comes to the door. And I'm still trying to figure out, how do you ask people, can you take me in? Yes, they may kill you. Yes, they may burn your house down. Yes, you're going to lose your job. But will you take me in anyway? So I still haven't figured out, because she's the first door I've knocked on. I haven't figured out, how do you ask somebody that? So I'm still stammering, and she looks me up and down, and she says, are you one of those freedom riders? And I was like, I don't know if I should say yes or no, but I said yes. And she said, I've been waiting on you all my life. Come in. That's beautiful. And that was the beginning of the Laurel Project. So that was Mrs. Eberta Spinks. Nobody other than those of us who, you know, were in Mississippi knows that name. That woman single handedly with the other two volunteers and I created the Laurel Mississippi Freedom Summer Movement because she knew everybody. So she got on the phone, she was calling, the women organized and threatened the pastor if he didn't let us have our meetings there. I mean, so as Charlie was mentioning, this was the inspiration of a lifetime. I'm like, these people are putting everything on the line. She had a home. Uh, her husband had a job. She had a son in high school. I mean, all of them could have been killed. And certainly their houses burned to the ground for letting me stay there and that becoming one of the headquarters sites for the movement. So the people uh, are what inspired me to know that I had to stand tall because if they were standing tall, I had to stand tall with them. I got your back. Um, Dr. Pan, that's the story Charlie. of all the SNCC projects. Mm. Say it again, Baba Charlie. I said, that's the story of all the SNCC projects across the South. That kind of strength that's almost always unexpected that you encounter in these communities. It's what really powered the movement. Mm. Could, 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 could. And I think this is entirely consistent with that. With, with, with both of you comment, um, we lost Bob Moses, uh, you know, it's, it's you two silly, no? mm -hmm. all three of you, know, uh, a few months ago. Just just comment on Bob. And I know this, <laughs> this is not easy. <laughs> all right, but whatever you'd like to say, what should be remembered about Bob Moses? Well, Bob what Moses I was. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Zahara. Okay. I mean, Bob Moses was one of the greatest organizers that it has been my privilege to know. And Bob's personal qualities, uh, his humility, his compassion, his deep, deep love for the people uh, that just radiated from him. Uh, in addition to his incredible mind uh, and the way he could uh, strategize how we were going to move forward. Um, I cannot speak too highly of him. He, he's at the top of those I admire most that I had the privilege of meeting and working with in the movement. Yeah, it's, it's Bob's almost total commitment that stands out in my mind. That's what you saw, the intensity of his commitment, which, which was from all the, Bob and I were very close, uh, both in Mississippi and in the years since uh, the Mississippi movement. And in everything he does, there's a kind of commitment there that you do not see often, it's total. Uh, and open at the same time. Uh, 
the first uh, one of the reasons I wound up staying in Mississippi, I think, is not only because of people like, say, Dory and Giat and, and, and the whole group, my age group, that was active in the movies, but also uh, since I was on the way to the conference, I needed to think about what their challenge to me. So they put me up in the Freedom House that they uh, maintain, uh, not far from the NAACP headquarters. And we're going back and forth. I'm asking them questions. They're explaining the movement. And Bob was in the room. It was the first time I met Bob. And he only said one thing in this conversation, and, and it really did change my life. He said, uh, we're going up in the Delta tomorrow. Why don't you come up with us? <laughs> yeah, that, that was a sum total of his involvement in this back and forth between Dory Ladner and Jesse Harris, a whole lot of people, the name won't. Be. And I did. I got in the car with him uh, and went up into the Delta and wound up staying in the Delta in Sunflower County. But I think Bob's simple question, and I don't know what he recognized in me that, that cause uh, that question uh, from him to me. Uh, and I don't even remember what I really thought at the moment about that kind of question, because I had given no indication that I was going to stay in <laughs> Mississippi. But I did. I went up there and I wound up Charles McLaurin and Lanny McNair and, and wound up staying in Sunflower County for the next uh, few months working on voter registration. Uh, and Bob is linked to that. It's, it's, it's it, his exact sense of how you talk to people. Hmm. And without bullying, without threatening, uh, without insulting, somehow manage to get them engaged uh, in the movement. You should hear Hollis Watkins talk about his first encounter with Bob, if you really want to understand that. And if I can do a commercial, read Hollis's autobiography, <laughs> you know, uh, to get a sense of, of that ability. It's, it's unique in some ways, I think. I think I think, it, but that's how I think of him. And I think that was really both rare and important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara Charlie. Um, Dr. Payne, would you also like to comment um, as well on Bob Moses? Mm -hmm. Boy, it's funny when somebody turns your questions back on you. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to leave the space. I, 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 I work. I, I work with Bob uh, in the algebra project. I don't know. I mean, he, Bob, Bob must have been a good 10, 10 years older than me, at least maybe fifteen, right? His capacity to do the work. I, I just remember we'd start at eight o'clock in the morning, at nine o'clock at night. We'd be on. on we, we'd still be going. He'd fall asleep in the car on the, on the way to the airport. His capacity to work just put the rest of us to shame. But the, the clarity of his focus on the development of other people, right? Um, I, yeah, I, 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 I guess, I mean, I, I would just leave it there. Uh, no, I'll say one other thing. When I first met him, I was trying to get him. I was teaching in Massachusetts. I wanted him. He had just come back from Tanzania. I had just started teaching civil rights movement. I'm going to get Bob Moses to come talk, 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 talk to my class. When, when, when he came, right, to my class, the thing, with, with all of his experience and with all, all of that history behind him, he goes into the class and says, and they will both smile at this, he, he says to my class, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> but his assumption, right? <laughs> I'm not going to go in there and talk about what's on my mind. I'm going to, where, where are you? And I think this is mm -hmm. a part of this exact sense of how to talk to people, right? But this deep respect, I remember being in, 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 in the basement, Rock Taylor Holmes in Chicago. He's teaching algebra to mostly a group of women, mothers in that, in that, in that, in that. And he's trying, he's trying to use the, the teaching them a class on the number line. That's a big thing 
in the algebra project, you've got to, to learn it. And to see his palpable joy when somebody got, oh, that's what you mean by a negative number. Oh, that means you 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 went two stops south as opposed to two stops north on the subway. When those lights were off for people, that may have been as happy as I've ever seen him, right? Is when people understood that they can master something that they've been told all their lives they could not master. Mm. All right, Jim, that's that's a tough one for me, but I'll stop it there. I so appreciate that. Um of course, I have like a thousand more questions. We already, when we did our pre-show, I already told y'all we're going to have to do a part two, okay? Um, because <laughs> there's so much of a wealth of knowledge that you guys have, so much we can learn, and just so much that you guys can share. Um, but what I would love to hear from you guys before we close out, um, because in this show, we really hope that a lot of Black educators um, watch and take our content and learn. But in this time, uh, with we see all the, the tumultuousness happening in education, I would love to hear from you guys who have been involved in like grassroots movements with education and, and building up, but being educators and scholars yourselves. Um, when you look at our, educa our current educational setting, what do you see um, as um, encouraging on the educational scene right now? And what things do you find concerning? Um, and yep, okay, Barbara Charlie, you could go first. <laughs> I was like, who to call on? I I fight against being discouraged mm. uh, at what I see in the schools. I'm not a teacher, and I haven't spent any real time in school since I was the years in which I was working on the Radical Equations book uh, with Bob, which had me going in and out of middle schools. But I still see this idea that in, infects uh, public education when it comes to black and brown. And that is simply put that you can't teach these students. Mm -hmm. you, they, they simply, it's not possible to teach these students. They're incapable of learning, of processing. That's mostly unless you're going to some elite private school or something like that where you get a different situation. But if you're talking about public schools, I use when I'm talking about public education, the example of Dunbar High School uh, in Washington, D.C. My mother went to that school, uh, high school, black high school in the 1930s when it was an elite Black school, this is where you wanted to send your kids to learn. Today, it's at the bottom of the educational scale. The, mm -hmm. the students coming out of Dunbar High School are reading, high school, are reading at an eighth grade level, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard to be encouraged <laughs> by what I see, if I'm going to speak uh, honestly. And what, what infects public schooling is the idea that black children cannot learn, that what the public schools should be are just warehouses until you pass them into menial job. That's, that's what I see. And I, I, I'm not in, I'm, I'm in more recent times, the whole argument, not even an argument, the so-called critical race theory uh, mm. debate. Uh, it's not even a debate. It's, it's the idea that you want to, it's an idea about preventing a true portrait of the country in in public schooling and it's a made up argument because i defy you to take me to uh, uh, any high school in the country where there's a course called critical race theory <laughs> so <laughs> it's a false uh, debate uh and uh you know, what they really are about is, you know, blocking what, for lack of a better phrase, among black consciousness. Mm. That's what I think. But, you know, 
we don't have enough time to go into my tirade about public education. We do in a part two <laughs> series, Baba, so I got you. <laughs> Baba Soraya. Well, um, I, I mean, I, I know we are running out of time. I have been in the classroom for college age people for 20 years, and I've been very involved here locally in the effort to force our school board in this county, Alachua County, to uh, implement something that is on the books in the Florida legislature has been for over 25 years mandating the teaching of African American, Native American, Latinx, and women's history in the schools. And, you know, the fight that we've been engaged in, and I've been a part of a uh, the statewide effort. Uh, to get that done. And so it's, you know, I'm somewhat discouraged also. The thing that gives me any uh, 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 hope is that I think our parents and many of our Black teachers and Black administrators, as well as allies, are recognizing that the public schools have become a pipeline, you know, a school to prison pipeline for particularly African American and Latinx young people. So we are finally, I think, in a stage where we see the tremendous harm that's happening in our schools. Uh, the resource officers, every school with a police officer with a gun on his hip. And so he or she are the disciplinarians. I mean, when I walked into a local school here and saw a cop sitting there with a gun on his hip, I would say, well, what's he doing in here? And the people looked at me like I was crazy. They said, what do you mean? They're in all the schools. These are our resource officers. And I said, well, what do they do? <laughs> and they said, they're here to discipline you. I said, what happened to the principals? What happened? I mean, what's going on here? And of course, we've seen the horrible pictures of children six years old in handcuffs, hand ties, being led out of school. I mean, this is ridiculous. And I think that we have to have a conversation about what happened around this so-called integration of schools. Uh, you know, another thing that Harry T. Moore was very involved in, they had a powerful Black educators a uh, group here in the state of Florida. And of course, once the so-called integration happened, that uh, group was disbanded. And mm -hmm. so many of the African-American teachers and administrators were fired. So we have got to look at how we, in an effort to do the right thing, which was really to get equal resources in our schools, we bought into the notion of integration and let people fire our teachers, close our predominantly black schools, bus our children into predominantly white schools where they often were met with hostility, et cetera. We have got to address what we have not done properly and save our children. Only we can do that. So this right. is what I think is happening, and I'm urging Black Lives Matter, the Dream Defenders, all the Black Youth Project 100, Moral Mondays, everybody has to put education at the top of the agenda that we are working to change. Mama Zora, you are speaking that truth. You are speaking that truth. Um, Dr. Payne, did you want to comment before we close out? Yeah, I know you're over time. I'll be, I'll be brief. I just I agree with everything uh, uh, my colleagues have said. I had wanted, had there been time to have a conversation with them about do they think we are how close are we to becoming a fascist state? I mean, how would out fascist in this country, right? As far as I'm concerned, this attack on so-called critical race theory is is just another step in a process in which there's only going to be one truth, and it'll be whatever the state says is truth, right? Uh, it's just one part of that process, and I do not think black people 
are sufficiently scared about what is going on broadly and what that means for, for, for our youth. Uh, and as Zohara is saying, at every level, we have to take, I just want to see black people arguing over what kind of education we want. I just want more argument, more discussion, right? But we have to begin taking control, not just of schools, but of school boards, after school, Saturday program. We have to rethink this, right? Because we do not want to go as bad as this education is right now, given if the remnants of the Republican Party get full control over this country, we have to be prepared at a whole different level. So uh, I'll stop there and, and be happy to talk about it later. Perfect. So as you guys know, even the folks in our comments are calling for a part two. Um, so we will definitely be coordinating. <laughs> definitely be coordinating schedules to get this going on and i want to give a shout out to joy jones who has been posting all like snick stuff and links and quoting you guys um as we've been doing this so i definitely want to shout her out for doing that but the people in the comments are calling for a part two so we will coordinate schedules to get a part two going on for uh 2022 um because we have to have you guys back on but i from the bottom of my heart just want to say that i thank you for all of the knowledge that you've been parting on, on us today, just being here and having the opportunity to talk to you guys and just giving us a moment and like sharing your voices and your stories with the people. And of course to you, Dr. Payne, for just getting this all together, brother, and just <laughs> helping me coordinate. Like I'm so appreciative. I already told you guys on Friday, like I'm being professional, but I am like fangirl ing, like because <laughs> this is a dream come true. For me, like this is one of those moments, like make your mama proud. All my hair, make my mama proud. Okay, so <laughs> I just want to thank y'all um, for today, and to all the folks out there watching, thank you guys so much for chatting with us today, for listening. Please like, comment, and share. And y'all know I'm gonna be back with y'all about when the part two will be happening. But we'll see you guys back here same time, same place next week when we will have Erica Huggins on with on, uh. with us next week. So I will we'll be here. <laughs> yes. So we'll see you guys next Thursday, same place, same time. Peace, everybody. Uh -huh. Peace.